Hey everybody, this is Perch. On the live stream I had with Eric, uh, which was great, by the way, if you haven't checked that out, go go listen to that. He's got a million things to learn, and that that is uh, that's somebody to listen to for sure, particularly on art and the art process. It's uh, it's absolutely worth your time. Um, but the question was asked about manga, and in particular, kind of comparing kind of the U.S. market with the uh, the market over in Japan, and kind of ways they're different, and also. How, how kind of one got a foothold over the other. Uh, I wanted to explain kind of taking a step back. And please, by the way, if you're thinking, I hate manga, I don't like it, for whatever reason that might be. This is not a video praising manga or, or talking about uh, how manga is better or anything like that. I'm just trying to call out kind of the differences. And I think whether you're a fan of manga or not a fan of manga, it's interesting from the standpoint of you will learn some things about kind of how that market developed over there and why it's different from over here. And, and in some ways, why I think there is a, a looming danger for North American kind of comics based on how this works. And by the way, I'm going to intersperse some stuff about uh, Europe as well, because that's a, a, you know, a third and different market, which probably deserves a full video. But let's talk. Let's talk manga for a second. So a couple things about manga. Um, I spent a decent amount of time in Japan uh, through the 90s and a lot more in the 2000s. And I, I mean, I've been I go to Japan once a year. It's been a year since I was in Japan last, thanks to the pandemic and everything else. It's, this is the longest stretch of, of not being in Japan since I want to say 94, 94, or 95. It's been a long time since I've been away from Japan for this long. I miss it. It's funny when you miss a place so much, you, you, you remember the smells like there's a smell of the subway, which sounds gross, but it, it's not. There's a uh, there's a smell there. And every now and then um, when people, uh, friends of mine will come over to visit from Japan, if they come immediately from the plane, because if you're flying from Japan to the US, especially on the West Coast, you land in the morning. So you, you kind of you take off at night, and you land in the morning and you haven't showered or anything. Typically, you'll have some business before uh, the person goes back to the hotel and, and uh, cleans themselves up. Uh, but you can smell the, the train you can see on, on these people. And it's a wonderful thing. It sounds creepy. Uh, I never tell these people this stuff in real life, by the way. It's like you smell like train. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't play off well, as you can well imagine. Uh, but. Uh, what, what I'm getting with all this is that in the 90s and in the, you know, the, the aughts, the 2000s, um, manga was everywhere and still is, but it, it is different uh, today. But for a long time, you would see manga, uh, you know, you had bookstores with heavy amounts of manga, floors and floors of manga. You would see manga in the train stations, you'd see it in the newsstands, you'd see it when you exit the train, when you exit the JR line, you come up and you are on the streets of Shibuya or Shinjuku, or Akihabara, or, or wherever you might be. Um, I mean, even Rapungi would have this kind of stuff. You'd see kind of uh, little stands or sometimes just, you know, blankets or sheets on the ground, on the sidewalk, with stacks of manga uh, just being sold. It was everywhere. And you would see people walking around with manga and the manga now is being printed. And this is where there's some similarities to Japan or to uh, Europe. It's uh, typically thick, kind of large uh, digests, uh, large books, uh, almost like mini phone books of content, cheap paper, usually black and white with a couple pages of color. And you'd see them, you, you could not not see them from the second the plane landed. And for a while, by the way, there was uh, a period of time where you'd come off an international flight, you'd head toward, uh, you know, your um, uh, immigration customs and then getting your bag. But before you hit customs, they would have like vending machines. They would have manga sold there. Like it was it was common for me taking the United flight from San, from SFO into Narita and you'd have manga there before I even hit customs. It's like it is everywhere. You'd see this stuff. And everybody is buying it. Old, young, you know, kids in school, uh, salarymen, everybody is buying manga. There was no stigma to buying comics. There was no, uh, it, there was never, and, and it, it just, you would certainly see this kind of otaku, people who are too into the comics. Uh, this, the stigma came in from people who maybe believed the comics were real or had no desire to actually get a girlfriend because the comics were all they needed. You know, people would be really, really into things. And there's series, is, there's series like uh, Video Girl Eye. Um, there, there's a couple. There, not more than a couple. There's tons of series where you see that the main protagonist is uh, just super into their manga and, and to, the, to the absence of life. And that's, that's too far. But by and large, everybody liked it. And there's another reason why I think it went well 
is so it's a commuter society. Very few people own cars. Very few people used cars. And frankly, if you ever go to Japan, you know, the, the madness is if, I mean, first of all, renting a car is idiotic. You, you are, you're an absolute fool if you're renting a car. And frankly, even just trying to take cabs is, is nuts. The train is dead simple. Like it is, it is hard to get lost. It is hard to screw up. Uh, the, the train and the train goes everywhere. You can get off the, the you, again, you can get off the plane in Narita. You can just continue to work your way down in the airport until you hit the rail. You have the Narita Express. It takes you into downtown Tokyo in an hour and change, you know, and basically 70 minutes, you know, you're standing there in, uh, at Tokyo station, you, you know, taking a cab or a bus would take you way longer than that and be stupid. Like, like it's just, there's no good reason to do it. So if people are on the train, what are they doing? Well, it's kind of socially unacceptable to make a lot of noise. You're not supposed to sit there having a big conversation. You're absolutely not supposed to talk on your phone. Uh, you will get dirty looks. You will be seen as a, a fool if you're doing that. So what do people do? Well, up until about 2004, 2005, they would read books. They would read manga. And it was very common, you know, when I was taking the train and, and I lived over there for quite a while, uh, you would see just rows and rows of people reading manga. You'd see people standing, reading manga. That's, that's the entertainment. And a train ride could take, I mean, you know, depending on how much you're making, salaryman would take 60 minutes to get to the office on the train. And that's like an hour commute. You're reading manga. And then what happens is the phone comes into the picture. And the phone technology is ass. I mean, we're talking the old flip phones, black and white, tiny screens and everything else. So um, what do we do? Well, we can play games, but the games were kind of discouraged. The games had to be very casual games. We're talking card games, kind of uh, minesweeper type things. Very, very simple. Because again, culturally, you don't want to make a lot of noise. You're not trying to do a lot of stuff. Uh, they can't be network connected because, you know, the, the you're in the rail and the network's not always great. And also, you, you know, you don't want the cultural distraction of playing something live with somebody else. Now, things have changed slightly, but still the cultural bias around sticking to yourself, not making a lot of noise is still true. And so one of the things that quickly gets done is let's get manga onto the phone. And the experience is terrible. Tiny screens, one panel at a time. It's just, it's not very good. However, the, the positives of not having to lug around a giant book of manga is huge on the phone. So as soon as that experience starts getting tolerable, people start going to it. And a lot of people, by the way, are still buying manga. You still got floors and floors of manga books. And frankly, you do today. You know, just a year ago, I'm going to bookstores and it's not like, uh, I, I posted some photos about a year ago of some uh, bookshops in Japan of just, just floors of manga. And I mean floors. I'm talking like you got to picture a, uh, you know, like a Yodabashi camera level Nobody knows that it's like a Walmart uh, style floor, except there's like nine floors or in some cases, 14 floors worth of like Walmart sized of electronics and all these other things. Not uncommon. One of those floors is manga. Like it, it, it just tons. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. I posted a photo. Somebody's like, ah, oh, we have the same thing here in, in New York and San Francisco. No, you don't. Not, not like this. And, and, <laughs> two bookstores, you, you go to Shibuya, you throw a rock, you're going to hit a manga store. There's, there's tons. Uh, it is, it, it is everywhere. So what happens is the phone experience is bad, but people are willing to put up with it because it's more convenient. And this has an interesting psychological effect in that people slowly get eased into the technology. Uh, which includes the artists. The artists get more time to kind of start drawing toward it. They, it gets it, it basically, because you have a willing audience adopting it right away, every year gets progressively better. And so even though people had complaints about, well, you know, I prefer paper in my hand, I prefer all that kind of stuff, um, there's still, it's still better to have it uh, on your phone. And, and you, every year when it gets better, you feel like your experience is getting better. So unlike the U S where there people are still kind of bridging the gap to get people to accept it on the phone at all, you have basically 15 years of people slowly acclimating to this digital platform. And now 2021, a lot of people have accepted it. 
because they eased into it over 15 years. It, it makes sense. The U.S. has not really started that clock yet. A lot of the comic collectors here haven't begun to migrate to digital. And it's, you know, they, so if you, if you just kind of do the same math, if it takes them the same amount of time to adopt it, we're 15 years away in the U.S. from having it. And on top of that, in the U.S., everybody drives. So there isn't this compelling need to have, you know, the, the train where you're able to read comics in this way. It's just, it's a very different environment. It's, it's a huge reason why digital is going to have a much harder time adapting and coming to this marketplace than it does in, uh, in Japan. It just, it fit there much better. But so I, let me, let me kind of try and wrap this up a little bit and I'll, I'll come back and touch on this topic again, because it's very interesting how it's different. Um, and it'd be, you know, we, we hear a lot about, well, at some point, you know, the, uh, the manga experience will be here or, you know, when are we going to catch up to Japan? The funny thing is I don't, I, as a technologist, I don't think we're ever catching up to Japan. You, you can't catch up in technology with a 15 year gap like that. We have a different animal going on over here. And maybe the, the warning sign should be that there's more manga and that style and those content, those, those titles being adopted in the U S then the U S titles are adopted in Japan. There's very little adoption of U S content in Japan. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't go over there. It doesn't fit. And in many cases, the comment that I hear from friends in Japan that pick up some of this stuff is wow, so expensive for so few pages. And in many cases, it looks and feels like stuff we were reading 20 years ago which in some ways it, it kind of is. That's, that's how the style has adopted, a, adapted. It's, it's a very, it's a fascinating piece. The, the part that strikes me the most is that, again, you have two generations, I would say, where culturally reading comics was not just acceptable, it was normal, it was cool. And here, we're still kind of fighting with it a little bit. The millennial group, uh, they definitely are more akin to, or more, more willing to accept comics, but it's still in a different way. It's more tied to social issues. It's more tied to kind of other things going on. It's not just appreciating comics for what they are, comics. And in Japan, there, there's more just basic appreciation for that. I will come and hit Europe as well, because Europe is a different animal, but I think that the kind of the cultural acceptance of comics in Europe is much closer to the way comics are culturally accepted in Japan. It's much more of a kind of a part in life, very distribu different distribution model, very different pace. Uh, but it is, it is more normal. It's more, more accepted as part of life. And here in the U S we still seem to struggle with it or, you know, ah, comics are for kids that, that there still is a little bit of that dynamic that goes on in North America. But anyway, like I said, this is just the beginning. Wanted to kind of get that out there. We'll talk more about this. Hey, uh, do you have questions? Let me know in the comments below, like, and subscribe most importantly, and I mean it. Thanks for listening.